and welcome to uh, York University's first Festival of Ideas. Um, we've got an online audience as well as all of you who've joined us here. One of the reasons I love doing these things is it's very good to be with a group of people who like to solve problems rather than create them, which I think is kind of unusual at the moment. Uh, so welcome to you all. Um, we're going to discuss Europe's role in defense and security on a world stage and perhaps underlying this topic is a question which has been talked about for many years but has never quite been resolved. The European Union has often been thought, rightly, as an economic superpower. But to the disappointment of some at least, it has failed to come together or seems incapable of coming together to speaking with entirely with one voice on defence and security matters. Ukraine may be changing that. We will see. We'll discuss that. Romano Prodi, Tony Blair and scholars including Mark Leonard and others have suggested that at some point in the 21st century, Europe, meaning the EU, will indeed be more coherent, more powerful, more assertive in its hard power, as well as its obvious soft power. So we are, after all, speaking of 500 million people or so, relatively rich, looking askance sometimes at Trump land or the impact of Trump on the United States, plus sharing legitimate fears of Putin and Russian expansion. So, is the time right for a more muscular EU? Is it possible? And here's a kind of perverse point. Is Europe's lack of muscularity actually in some ways a strength? Because unlike the United States or China or Russia, maybe this group, because of lack of coherence or other reasons, are not quite so bossy. Oh, and as an afterthought, where, if anywhere, does Brexit Britain fit into this when we're talking about Europe? Although that may be a topic for another day, I think we'll, people will want to know something about it. Let me introduce our distinguished panel. Next to me, Professor Malcolm Chalmers is Deputy Director General of the Royal United Services Institute, known to us all as RUSI. Uh, joining us on Zoom is Bridget, Bridget Laffin. Good to see you, Bridget. Long time no see. And is, <laughs> she's Emer Emeritus Professor at the European University Institute and was Director at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies. Um, Sultan Barakat is uh, uh, at the end there and is the Founding Director of the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies and a Professor at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies in Qatar. And Shane O'Rourke, is a historian of Russia and is a senior lecturer in the Department of History here at the University of York. So what I'm going to suggest is that we'll give each of our guests a, a few minutes just to set the scene for us in this. They've got diverse opinions on quite a uh, uh, diverse topic. Set the scenes for us, scene for us, we'll engage in a discussion, and then we'll throw it open to questions for those of you who are here. And people online can also give questions, which if I can uh, get to them, I will read from the screen in front of me. Um, Malcolm, would you like to begin? Thank you very much indeed, Gavin, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you all uh, today. In international affairs, it really does feel as if things are moving faster uh, than ever. Uh, the last part, the last half of February, I was due to spend in Moscow. Uh, we were running two conferences with quite a bit of support from our government here in the UK. The first week, it was going to be about how to avoid conflict. <laughs> that went pretty well. <laughs> and, and the second week, the second week was about climate change. It was about following up those conversations in Glasgow on COP26, uh, uh, chaired by Alex Sharma, the British cabinet minister. Uh, and of course, Russia is the fourth largest carbon emitter in the world, and uh, those emissions are not falling. So that was a very practical follow-up to uh, see British ministers and Russian ministers talking about that. The biggest threat the planet faces in the long term, uh, as we all know. But of course, we ended up uh, abandoning the climate event. Uh, because of the invasion. And we ended up going to Moscow with a much smaller group of people, uh, just a handful of us, uh, going to Moscow in the week before an invasion. And to be honest, uh, uh, going to Moscow before that visit, I was not convinced, despite uh, everything that was being released to the media, that Putin could actually uh, be so crazy as to launch this invasion. But I left after conversations with government officials in Moscow uh, convinced that they were going to launch an invasion, and that indeed they did uh, four days after uh, we left. Uh, but that counterposition, I think, remains an important one, uh, and it's part of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, that uh, 
it's a microcosm really of the problem of international order writ large. We are on the one hand in a world in which there's an intensification of competition between the major powers of the world, the United States, Russia, and China in particular, but actually much broader than that in terms of interstate competition. But on the other hand, there are problems like global health, like climate security, like dealing with new technologies which are likely to transform the nature of even what it is to be human in the next uh, half a century in the lifetime of our children and grandchildren, uh, which can't be tackled uh, by states acting alone. Even the largest states have to cooperate with each other. China's the largest carbon emitter, two and a half times as much emissions as the United States, India coming up very rapidly, and so on. But that reassertion of geopolitical competition is making that harder. And both Russia and China uh, are asserting themselves more strongly. Uh, uh, it, from their point of view, as I think we began to hear uh, in the last session, particularly from Sam Green, uh, the, the, Russians, uh, the Russian state, not only Putin, the Russian state has a sense of of grievance, a wish to return to uh, its borders, its imperial possessions uh, that it had in the past. And interestingly, actually, when Putin explained, explained the invasion uh, in those first couple of days, he started by criticizing Lenin. <laughs> Uh, and Lenin betrayed the Russian imperial project. So I think things are complicated and not always what they at first appear. But for me as a military defense analyst, uh, I mean, I've taken part in many uh, war gaming exercises. You imagine some scenario, you think, well, what would Putin do in this scenario? What was she doing in this scenario? Uh, and all that. But it's quite another thing when it actually happens. Uh, what happened in February, really unprecedented for, for several decades. And I think the reality of the situation which uh, we, I think, grown up with is that uh, certainly for the last half century or more, most invasions, most military interventions end up being much more complicated than those starting the intervention think. And they usually end in failure. And that was true in Vietnam. <laughs> it was true in the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. It was true in the US-led interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, as, we, as we've seen now. And it's true also, I think, uh, in, uh, in many other places. And it's true, I think it will be true in the end in, uh, in Ukraine. But I think the lesson of most of those interventions is that it doesn't end quickly. And I think we are probably, who knows, but we're probably in for a protracted conflict and we're really almost just in the foothills of uh, the devastation that that conflict uh, will lead to. But I think the other side of recent developments, particularly this year, is that the West is fighting back. Uh, the West is more united than ever. The G7 countries are more united than ever in Asia as well, in Asia Pacific region, the Australians, uh, the South Koreans, the Japanese, uh, with Europe uh, on sanctions in a way which they were not in 2014. And we have a United States under this president who's prepared to lead uh, that effort. Can you imagine for a moment if Vladimir Putin had invaded Ukraine or launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine when Donald Trump uh, was president, <laughs> a president who uh, seemed to be more sympathetic to Putin than to Zelensky. He didn't basically distrust the democratic leaders. Uh, a president who was more concerned to get dirt from the Ukrainian president to use against Joe Biden than he was to provide Ukraine with the military assistance which it was already asking for. So we dodged a bullet there in my, in my estimation. Uh, but actually, I think... Uh, that, that unity is having quite profound consequences. One of the consequences, one important consequences, is as well as that military unity, uh, there's also a real uh, determination to reduce economic dependence on Russia and to a lesser extent to China uh, in areas of security interest. And we spent the last two decades and more uh, 
deepening economic uh, interdependence to some significant economic advantage to ourselves. So I think one of the things we should remember about sanctions, which maybe is not true if you're talking about sanctioning Iran or North Korea, but it is true if you're talking about sanctioning Russia, even more so China, is that those sanctions have real costs for those imposing the sanctions. So the British economy did benefit. We, Gavin talked earlier about uh, Londograd and so on, but that brought real economic benefit to many uh, people in the UK. Uh, it wasn't simply higher property prices. There was a lot of money spent by lots of Russians taking their money out of Russia and spending it here, and that's now going to be spent in Dubai uh, more, than, more than here. And the, for the Germans uh, to reduce, and others in Europe to reduce their dependence on on uh, Russian fossil fuels, which they are going to do, is going to cost their economy, especially in the short term, but also the cost of living crisis, to some extent driven right now by, by that crisis. So that's going to be costly. And we're also going to have to get more used to another really quite fearful consequence of the rise of uh, geopolitical competition, because this competition is taking place with countries, all of whom have significant arsenals of nuclear weapons. There's no such thing as a victory <laughs> between nuclear powers. There can be a relative advantage, but there's no such thing as an absolute victory. And uh, all those countries are prepared to threaten to use those weapons in certain circumstances. And of course, part of the answer in a Russia context is mutual deterrence. Can you imagine this crisis happening if Russia had had nuclear weapons, but no NATO states had had nuclear weapons, it would have panned out, I would suggest, in a rather different way. But nuclear weapons, nuclear arsenals, don't cancel each other out. They provide, they, they throw a shadow, if you like, a nuclear shadow over the conflict, which can never be forgotten by any of the participants. And it's uh, one of the fascinating facts of the period since the Soviet Union first uh, exploded a nuclear device in 1949. The United States uh, and the Soviet Union have both, uh, and then the Russia, have both avoided fighting directly against each other at any stage during that period. Their forces have avoided that. And it remains one of the driving factors for American policy in Ukrainian uh, crisis, and I think quite rightly. Uh, but the fact that there has been that degree of limitation hasn't prevented this war being conducted in a way which is more reminiscent than anything else of the tactics of Hitler and Stalin uh, during World War II, massive deportations, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian citizens, many, many children taken thousands of miles from their homes in Ukraine to be resettled in Russia, arrests and executions. I think we know all what's going on. But Ukraine is a massive country twice the size, more than twice the size of the UK, uh, and uh, Russian military resources, Russian economic resources, much more limited uh, than the Soviet Union had in World War II. And you know, today, Ukraine is getting support. It could get more, but it's getting very significant military support from the United States, from the United Kingdom, from other European countries, which is quite the opposite uh, of World War II. Uh, there are some in Russia who say, who are arguing today, that Putin is far too soft. He needs to change the special military operation into what they call a new patriotic war. But in the great patriotic war, uh, in World War II, uh, the United States provided, uh, provided uh, the Soviet Union with 13,000 tanks, 400,000 tr uh, trucks, millions of, of, of tons of grain, and today the boot is on the other foot. So the final point, Gavin, if I may, is this. If Russia loses in Ukraine, then it is going to make it harder for it to do the same thing again. And that will, I think, be a very positive step for European security. But it's not yet clear whether Russia will lose in Ukraine. And if Russia wins in Ukraine, whatever that means, then we're going to have a very bumpy ride ahead. And Europeans are going to have to get their act together very quickly in order to deter further aggression. Thank you very much.
Malcolm, thank you. I will pick up some of those points in a moment. I would say with the great patriotic war, I've had a great deal of fun talking to Russian officials and asking them why they started that war on the wrong side. But that's a matter for another, for another day. Let me bring in Bridget now. Bridget Laffin, maybe you could just set the scene for us for you, from your perspective, Bridget. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to join you from Dublin on uh, what is probably the great question questions of our time. And uh, obviously, the 24th of February is a transformative moment in, in our world, but on our continent, and also, I think, a moment of truth. In December 2019, Joseph Borrell, at his first meeting of the General of the Foreign Affairs Council, the EU Council, he said to the foreign ministers, Europe has choices to make. Either it wants to be a player or a placing in the emerging global competition that we see. So most of the issues that are raised by the war in Ukraine were on the table already. They're just on the table in a completely new context and with much greater urgency. Uh, and when thinking about, and I will focus more on the EU than on uh, wider Europe, uh, one has to ask what how can the EU respond to uh, the shifts and shocks since the 24th of February? But let me begin by something that is really important happened this week, and that's enlargement. Because one of the important aspects of the EU's toolkit is its ability to be a magnetic, to act as a magnet for the states in its neighborhood. And the prospect of membership is a prospect that allows for a European future, that allows for a future within a rule-bound system, treaty-based, which is extremely important for small and weak states, and that gives them an opportunity to forge a prosperous path. And there is a great irony, because obviously Boris Johnson was in Kyiv yesterday, that the United Kingdom is pl placing such emphasis on the sovereignty of Ukraine, but its interpretation of UK sovereignty brought it out of the most significant sovereignty pooling institution in the world. Uh, and I think there is a tension there uh, for the London government, but more generally for the future of UK foreign and security policy. But going back to uh, going back to enlargement, uh, since 2004, the Big Bang enlargement, the EU really didn't want more enlargement. It suffered from enlargement fatigue. It was struggling with the politics of scale. And of course, because uh, the last enlargements brought countries into the EU with weaker democratic histories and credentials uh, and also much poorer, uh, the EU has faced uh, a, an internal rule of law crisis, particularly with Hungary and Poland, but not just. So for the EU to reopen the enlargement dossier, uh, something very important has to have happened. They have stalled on the Western Balkans, uh, but the war in Ukraine was accompanied by applications very quickly from Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. And enlargement has always had a geopolitical dimension. Uh, and this, uh, this phase will also reopen uh, the, Bal the Western Balkans. So this was a very momentous week for enlargement. There was the visit during the week of Macron, Schulz and Draghi to Kyiv saying that these three, the three most important EU member states, were going to support a membership perspective and candidate status for Ukraine. And that is not something one would have, uh, could have assumed, in my view, uh, before the 24th of February. The Commission on Friday gave a, favor a favorable opinion on Moldova and Ukraine, and I anticipate that the European Council on the 24th, 23rd and 24th of June next week, they will also begin the pathway towards the membership of the large uh, of the large post-Soviet Eastern neighbours. And that uh, will require the for for the EU to date, although enlargement has had a very geopolitical or a very technocratic set of processes, opening over 30 negotiating boxes, closing them 
periodically, opinions by the commission, almost as if there were train tracks. And when you w- went on those train tracks, you stayed to the very, uh, you stayed to the very end, technical and technocratic. This enlargement cannot be handled this way for the for the most importantly, because it will be not just technical and technocratic, and the EU has to establish the conditions for access to the club. So I'm not saying the EU simply voids all conditionality. It can't and it won't. But there also must be a constant political engagement with what is happening in the East and in the Balkans. And that's been missing uh, until now. And that by definition implies that the European Council will have to be the command ship of this process because uh, it's the institution with the political authority that can bring together the capitals and the whole. I would suggest that as a priority that the EU establishes a either one of two things, a group of wise men, women, that look at enlargement and its processes and look at what is now required in the 21st century for the next 20 years, or that, like EMU, the presidents of the institutions are asked to map out a roadmap, a set of scenarios. Uh, There's already a very live discussion in Europe on uh, on, uh, enlargement. And Macron has already talked of a European political community, which would not be a substitute for, but would complement uh, membership of the EU. There's also perhaps something that may be of interest to the United Kingdom eventually, a European Security Council that would bring in non-member states. I would argue that all of that simply complements EU membership and that no poor state will ever want a second class membership or a membership that doesn't give them all the rights and obligations of full engagement in the club. I would suggest that one way of thinking about this is to break down the key into packages and rather than seeing enlargement as a ladder to be climbed, that countries get access to parts of the EU on a rolling basis. For example, one could envisage Ukraine uh, becoming uh, getting access to free movement. The temporary protect, uh, protection directive virtually gives that already, uh, but free movement before uh, full membership, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I'm arguing is that enlargement in the 21st century will have to be looked at extremely carefully if Europe is to use, the EU is to use that major policy instrument that it has uh, as part of. Europe's wider security. It's not defence, but it's the wider security constellation. In other words, how many countries will be part of the EU club and by definition then part of the Euro-Atlantic club? Uh, And this implies internal reform on the EU, but it is vital not just uh, that Russia doesn't win the war, whatever we mean by that, but also that Russia doesn't win uh, the model. In other words, that countries in the eastern half of the continent are free to choose their pathway to be part of the security and defence order that is Europe. That's not going to involve NATO membership for some of these countries, but EU membership has got to be looked at, not as an alternative, but as part of the security of that part of the world in the longer term. Let me finish by saying that in terms of how we conceptualize the kind of EU that is needed, uh, I would argue that what we need to look at is what I would call collective power Europe. That collective power Europe has been emerging over the last set of crises. Brexit, pandemic, and now Ukraine, the EU has become a much more robust political entity, much more agile with its toolkit, much more capable of responding despite the constraints of being 27. And I would argue that what we need to look at in terms of the EU is not a scaled up version of uh, the nation state, which is neither desirable nor available, but rather a polity and an entity that's got sufficient agility and resources to get things done, to mobilize 
to adapt and to respond. In other words, I'm arguing for pragmatism, experimentalism, uh, rather than this sense that the EU, because it is not like a nation state, is full of deficits. All political systems, all polities have deficits. We just tend not to use appropriate benchmarks when looking at that sui generis, quite distinctive entity that is the EU. And I would argue that this system uh, is robust, uh, is resilient, and will be part of not the only, but an absolutely central part uh, to the future of Europe's security order, and also absolutely a se uh, central in global terms to the areas of cooperation that haven't gone away. All those areas that have already been mentioned that Europe will contribute to on climate technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So even though I'm speaking to an audience in Brexit Britain. Uh, it is not in the interests of the United Kingdom that the EU is not ad agile enough, capable enough or responsive to the changes that we face. That would be very bad news for the United Kingdom. Thank you. Bridget, thank you very much. And we'll pick up, I'm sure, some of those points with the panel uh, in, in a moment. But first, Sultan, uh, maybe you could set the scene for us from your perspective. Well. I, I think diplomacy does work. And in this context, it almost worked back in 2014. But I don't, uh, I don't think it was backed enough and there was not enough political will to make the issue uh, or to prevent the war in, uh, in Ukraine. And I know this is a minority view and maybe shocking to some. Uh, and I'm not in any way trying to explain Russia's position or, in, or uh, apologize on behalf of Putin or anything. But uh, uh, if we go back to November 2013, when the former president of Ukraine, Yankovic, uh, took a position, he was very pro-Russia, and he took a position against this trade deal and, the, and pulling Ukraine closer to, to the EU, which was really based on the fact that right from 1988 onwards, there was a gentleman agreement to keep Ukraine neutral. The Russians withdrew the nuclear weapons, and it was meant to remain out of, uh, out of threat as far as, as Russia is concerned. There is an important access to the Black Sea for Russia uh, uh, through or via Ukraine. There are enormous opportunities to do with the Road and Belt Initiative from China, uh, the gas pipelines, etc. So all of that passes through this important area. And uh, uh, then I think we saw the demonstrations that took place uh, in Kiev uh, for and against the uh, potential integration with the EU economically, which the Russians have read not just economically, that this is the first step to do more. And soon after uh, the president uh, fled the country in 2014 as a result of this pressure, of course, in March, Russia moved in and annexed Crimea and had that referendum which show, show a majority of the population wanting to join, etc., so which we all know. Now that what it did is it encouraged other republics, and these are the two regions in particular that have the majority Russian-speaking uh, people, to follow a similar uh, fate as in Crimea, but not to join Russia. They were demanding independent status. And they had their own type of elections or referendum uh, and declared, uh, wanted to declare a, a, a people's republic in these areas. Now, the issue here, I think, is that all of this has had political dip diplomatic involvement. France and Germany and the OSCE played a very important role in trying to close the gap between the different opinions, including the local actors in eastern uh, Ukraine. And in 2015, they signed 14 first, the Minsk one, and then there was Minsk two agreement, which could have seen an end to the problem. But then the issue came that these two agreements were never, were not complete, and no agreement is complete. And I was, and the ambassador and the general here, were all involved in the discussion between Taliban and the United States, and it's on two sides of an A4. It's never a, a full agreement, but it is a starting point. And that's where we needed the EU and the OSC and all these other institutions that are meant to really create opportunities for peace to come in, 
and support the implementation of those agreements. From the Ukrainian side, they saw it as a victor's peace. They saw that the, what they signed up to was not fair, but they had to sign up to it because of the Russian pressure. And from the Russian side, they saw them not implementing what they agreed. And what they agreed was very, was, was very simple, that these two republics will get a special status within the sovereignty of Ukraine. The Russians, of course, saw this as an opportunity to have a veto power on bigger Ukrainian decisions. But it was going to give a degree of autonomy to the population to be able to live and speak in what they perceive as a Russian culture, uh, which they perceive it to be under threat given the rise in the Ukrainian nationalist uh, feeling. And on the Ukrainian side, they expected the Russians not just to withdraw their proxies, because they had few of those already have crossed the border, but also to uh, withdraw any, uh, stop any recognition of potential full independence, and also to stop supporting these uh, separatist movements. But that did not happen, and it was left to escalate. Uh, and then the unfortunate thing, I think, in 2000, uh, well, it continued as a kind of fighting on the streets at a low, low level with intervention from Russians and so on. But uh, again, back in 2000, uh, 2021, towards the end, Russians made it very clear to the rest that we do not want Ukraine to join NATO and that NATO, joining NATO is a red line. And it wasn't just about Ukraine. I mean, there were a number of gentlemen agreements to do with Sweden, Finland. There's a whole buffer zone between the United States and its ally, uh, the Europeans, and the Russians. Now, that was ignored, I think. And the leaked letter that was sent by the American ambassador to Moscow uh, uh, in, uh, towards November or January, no, maybe January 20. 22 was uh, was really saying we're willing to discuss and this is something for the Russians with the way they see themselves and the power and the restored confidence I think that they are at the moment living which has come back with a restored uh, economic power and greater influence particularly within the region of Central Asia and and, and South Asia uh, they found it very difficult to accept that after all of this, we're still talking about we are willing to talk of, uh, of disarming or stopping ballistic missiles from being based in these countries, but ultimately to join NATO or not is a sovereign decision. And uh, that, I think, in itself is, uh, is an issue that should have been addressed diplomatically. There were openings for it. Uh, the whole idea of not engaging is ridiculous, to be honest, because ambassadors are paid to talk to enemies. I mean, I don't understand where did this come from, that the time you have a crisis, you withdraw your ambassadors, we don't talk. They're meant to be talking, that's where you really want to invest them. And it is now the time to talk more and more. I think we need to uh, talk more to the local population in the eastern Ukraine to understand better their position on, on this conflict. Uh, because ultimately, without them being on board, you can never resolve this issue. And uh, more engagement is required with, with Russia. Uh, in terms of who can do it, uh, the EU obviously now, with their very clear position, have burned the cars that were in the hands of Germany and France in particular. OSCE is unlikely. We're looking now towards maybe Turkey playing a role. Uh, but Turkey can only convene around the security and the stability of the Black Sea, and may have this, they have that joint interest with Ukraine and Russia around the, the Black Sea, and they may be a good option to, to host more talks. Uh, in conclusion, I don't really think Russia will lose the war. I mean, I think they will probably uh, use even worse and more violent outcomes. Uh, the, uh, the West is not going to support Ukraine to the level of actually intervening to beat the Russians back. The Ukrainians will pay a greater price. More and more civilians will die. More and more Ukrainian recruits will die. Earlier we heard about Alicia's brother who apparently was living in Holland and moved back to fight in Russia. And, and the things can only get worse. Worldwide, economically, it, we're, it's already panning out in terms of the results, uh, food security becoming an issue. Uh, a country like Egypt, which relies 27% of its food import on both Russia and Ukraine, uh, 
uh, could be destabilized very, very quickly. Uh, so there are many, many uh, grave consequences. Uh, having said that, there are some opportunities. I think now with Europe needing gas, and uh, of course where you cannot use the pipeline, so liquid, uh, liquefied gas is, is the answer. They've turned to Qatar to try and supply the gap. Qatar has already committed much of its resources when it was under blockade and panicked to Korea, Japan, and Southeast Asia, so they don't have much surplus. But guess who has the surplus now? It's Iran. And the Qatari and the Iranians share the, the gas fields. And maybe this, there is a, a silver lining of this crisis that now we can address another long-term frozen issue, sanctioned uh, Iran, which, uh, which has uh, huge supplies of gas that can help uh, Europe and, and beyond. I'll stop here and come back to the discussions. Thank you very much, Sultan. And we'll conclude this section with, with Shane. Go ahead, Shane. OK, what I want to do in this bit is to actually give you a brief uh, understanding of the deeper historical conflict of, of the present conflict. Uh, because without an understanding of that, I don't think we can really begin to see a way forward uh, out of the, uh, the mess that we're in at the moment. And I should make my own position clear uh, from the start. I think uh, unambiguously this war is the fault of the Russians. It's a war of annihilation against Ukraine. And that the only way for a lasting peace in Europe is for a major Russian defeat in Ukraine. Um, when I look at it, over the last three months, what we've uh, seen uh, since the war began is a frenzied attempt to understand why did it happen? You know, what did we do wrong? Why did Putin do this? Uh, what should we have done differently? And that's perfectly understandable and perfectly legitimate. But if we look at the war in a much longer context, we actually see that it's not isolated. This isn't an isolated war. It's part of a much larger pattern of behavior that extends back at least 500 years in which uh, the, um, the Russians basically attempt to suppress Ukrainian identity, any expression uh, of U Ukrainian identity. And what I want to suggest to you today is to have two ways of looking at this war. One is uh, more narrowly at Russian-Ukrainian relations over the long term, and I'm talking about over the past 500 years. And the second is to conceive of the war as, as a continuation of, a, of the European colonial wars of the 19th century. Uh, and I think that will help us understand uh, better how we might go forward uh, from, from this position. So first, I should say that um, in whatever form the Russian state has existed, in its Muscovite, its imperial, its Soviet, and now post-Soviet forms, it's attempted to suppress Ukrainian identity. If we go back to the 17th century, there was an independent Cossack state, the Hetmanate state in Ukraine. Uh, it signed a treaty of friendship with, uh, with the Muscovite state, uh, with Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich and uh, in which the um, Ukrainians thought they'd signed up for a, a limited contractual bargain in which both people were free to walk away when it knows, no longer suited them. But for the Muscovite side, it was a signature of perpetual uh, submission to, to the Muscovite state. And it, this, I think this treaty and the interpretations of it are emblematic uh, of, of the whole subsequent course of Ukrainian-Russian relations. Uh, the Ukrainians believing one thing and the Muscovites uh, and the, later the Russians having a very different interpretation. In the 18th century, uh, both Peter the Great and Catherine the Great absorbed more Ukrainian territory. And again, both were extremely careful to suppress any sort of uh, expression of Ukrainian identity. When Catherine, after the partition of Poland, absorbed a huge amount of uh, Ukrainian territory, the territory was divided into three separate provinces with no administrative links between them. And the whole idea was that they would not conceive of themselves as some sort of a collective, uh, as a unity, but they were simply another other, uh, part of pr provincial Russia. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, Nicholas I, uh, even the more liberal Alexander II, all attempted to suppress uh, Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian language, uh, any expression of Ukrainian national identity, uh, brought down the wrath of the state upon the people. 
uh, expressing it. And as I say, this was uh, the norm through, through the 19th century. The great figure, uh, the father of the Ukrainian nation, the modern Ukrainian nation, Taras Shevchenko, uh, died in a czarist prison uh, uh, as a martyr. Uh, and again, we, we see that um, you know, in, in different guises, the Russian state attempts to, uh, to destroy a Ukrainian identity. In the 20th century, in the Russian Civil War, for instance, the white side, the anti-Bolshevik side, uh, it was led by generals, the white generals, Denikin, uh, Kolchak, he was an admiral, not a general, but he was in Siberia. Um, there was also um, uh, Udenich in the north, and they fought under the slogan, Russia won an indivisible, <coughs> Uh, a disastrous slogan for them because it alienated the Poles, the Finns, the Georgians, virtually all the non-Russian uh, minorities, uh, and it, in, in, in many ways it cost them the civil war. But um, Putin, in many ways, is the successor to the white generals, to, to Denikin particularly in the volunteer army. He sees what he, as I understand it, he sees himself uh, as fighting for Russia one and indivisible. And that indivisible includes Poland, it includes the Baltic states, and it obviously includes Ukraine as well. So again, even in that sort of uh, post-imperial Russia stage, you see a very clear commitment to uh, taking over Ukraine. Uh, under Stalin, of course, we see uh, the most determined attempt to obliterate Ukrainian identity. The Ukrainian cultural elites, the, um, the, the Ukrainian Communist Party, uh, the Ukrainian intelligentsia in, uh, in general was targeted for extermination, i.e. these are the people who express uh, the identity of the nation. Uh, all of these were eliminated under Stalin. And of course, uh, Stalin then targeted the main reservoir of Ukrainian identity, the peasantry. Uh, in the early 30s, there was the Holodomor, the terrible famine in Ukraine, which was deliberately instigated by Stalin, deliberately uh, manipulated by him uh, to kill uh, or to destroy the resistance of the Ukrainian peasantry. Four, four million people died as a, as a result of that, um, of that famine. And so what, what we see then is that uh, Putin's war is, is a continuation of these long-term trends in Russian history that have been uh, more or less intense depending on the time. Uh, they reached a peak of barbarity, obviously under Stalin, uh, but uh, under Putin, this war, again, is, uh, is certainly much closer to the methods he used than to the methods that the Tsarist state used in, um, uh, in, the, in the 19th century. The areas under occupation in Ukraine at the moment involve the uh, purging of the Ukrainian population, the suppression of the Ukrainian language, deportation uh, of large numbers of the population. And again, if we look at some of the rhetoric coming out of the Kremlin or out of its news agencies, uh, RIA Novosti, for instance, we get openly genocidal articles uh, calling for effectively genocide in Ukraine. So again, I think what we're seeing in Ukraine is uh, with Putin's war is the working out of you know, much longer term trends in Russian history. It's not simply something that's based on what we did wrong in the immediate uh, previous 10, 15 years. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about very briefly is uh, we need to see this war uh, as the last of the European colonial wars. Uh, that you know, The British, the French, the Germans, uh, all, of, all of the European states had colonial empires. Uh, Russia also was a great colonial empire. Uh, it stretched at its peak uh, to the Pacific, into Alaska, down into Southern California, at one point in the mid-19th century, the Russian Empire shared a border with Mexico. Uh, it gives you some idea of the extent uh, of, of the empire at, at its height. But what's, uh, what's happened in Europe, uh, the, first, or the First and Second World Wars, the, um, the anti-colonial movements that, that grew up in the 20th century, all of the European empires uh, gradually came to the acceptance that their time was over, uh, that the age of imperialism of, of the 19th century type had passed. That, uh, you know, for the French, it came at Dien Bien Phu, for the British, it was at Suez, um, and, you know, maybe there are still uh, sort of imperial nostalgia alive in, in Britain and France, you certainly see it with Brexit, but by and large, there's an acceptance that the age of empire is over. 
In Russia, that has never happened. There has never been that acceptance that the age of empire uh, is over. Uh, they, um, most Russians, I think, I mean, I've spent 30 years uh, going back and forth between here and Russia, still think of themselves as an imperial nation. They think of themselves as, um, as a great power. They don't see themselves as, as members of a European community in a broad sense. They don't see themselves as one country among many others. Uh, and this isn't a view that's restricted to Putin. It extends into the Russian elites and, as I said, to a large part of the Russian population as well. If we look at the role of the Orthodox Church in this conflict, it's been an absolute disgrace. Patriarch Kirill has done uh, more than anyone to legitimise Putin's war, to legitimise uh, the attacks on Ukraine. Uh, you know, quite rightly, the British have sanctioned him and unfortunately the EU couldn't because of the Hungarians. But again, we see that that imperial mentality is spread across the, uh, the whole of the, um, uh, you know, the, the Russian body politic, I think. And um, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the diplomat and scholar, uh, once said that without uh, Ukraine, Russia is just another country. But with Ukraine su suborned and dominated, um, Russia is already an empire. So what I'm saying is that uh, whatever happens to Putin, whatever happens to his regime, unless there is a fundamental mind shift in Russia itself about their place, how they see themselves, and how they see themselves in the world, then actually, uh, you know, we're going to find ourselves in this situation again and again, unfortunately. So thank you. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, everybody, for those, those opening remarks. Can I try and pull some of these threads uh, together, uh, beginning with you, Malcolm? I mean, the big question in everybody's mind is, how do we get out of this? How do we get Putin out of it? <laughs> What can we do positively? And you know, uh, Sultan's uh, you know made a plea for democracy, even with people that you don't trust, uh, and that's going to be quite difficult, isn't it? I think the short-term prospects for some sort of negotiated way out of this. Sorry, I meant diplomacy. I should say, yeah, not yeah, democracy. I, I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, the short-term prospects for for a negotiated settlement are very poor, but there will come a time when a negotiated way out of this has to be sought. But I think that has to follow uh, a significant setbacks by the Russian military. Mm -hmm. I think from the point of view of Ukrainians, uh, every town that's captured, every area that's captured by the Russians is a large extra group of people who are expelled from their own homes. Sometimes, as we were saying, deported to Russia, uh, their homes destroyed. The Donbass today, <laughs> uh, after a long period uh, under Russian influence, and it, I mean, it, it was controlled by Russia, indirectly, yes, but it was controlled by Russia and Russian security services. It wasn't an autonomous republic in any real sense. Uh, three quarters of the population had left. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it was devastated. Donbass was one of the uh, most important, prosperous industrial areas of the Soviet Union. A lot of British capital, British experts went there to help build up the coal and steel industry there. And uh, the last vestiges of it gone in Mariupol with the devastation going on there. Uh, and uh, Ukrainians, I think, very understandably don't want that repeated in one area after another, especially as they know uh, that Putin's ultimate objective, and Russians I speak to now, I'm, I'm speaking to Russians every week, and the Russians' ultimate objective, if they can achieve it, mm -hmm. is to dominate the whole of Ukraine. It is not about taking bits of Ukraine. So I think before you get to a negotiation, uh, it has to be from a position uh, where Ukrainians are strong enough to do a deal which does not mean uh, that it creates the conditions for another war in another year in our two years or three Because it just, it's just to follow up briefly, and I want to bring in Bridget, yeah. but uh, I mean, we could be in a situation that we're in in Korea, which is that there's a line uh, dividing a country, wherever, mm -hmm. the Donbass mm -hmm. or whatever, and that it's very dangerous, but somehow it's accepted, because it's, it's certainly been accepted in Korea for 70 years. I think that's right. But of course, the Korean War started <laughs> with a line there, mm -hmm. and it more or less ended the same place. three years later <laughs> with a line in the same place. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, th I think that's very different from this situation, which uh, the, the, I mean, I'm not saying that we must insist that the Ukrainians gain every last mm -hmm. bit of Crimea before you talk. I mean, I think that would be absurd. It's primarily for the Ukrainians to decide, the Ukrainian government to decide 
the terms for that negotiation. But you know, this war could end tomorrow if the Russians pulled out of Ukraine. Yes. Uh, this is a, the, the, whole, I mean, the whole basis for the settlement uh, at the end of World War II. It used to be, in the old days, before World War II, borders in Europe changed every mm -hmm. couple of years. Mm -hmm. And that's why we had a continent at war for hundreds of years at the end of World War II. Once, uh, once the great powers changed the borders once more, uh, they said, right, this is it, it's fixed. You have to stick to these borders and live with it. If you have minority problems, deal with them within your own country. Uh, and it, 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 part of the reason why Europeans, I think, are so strongly feel that this, uh, this cannot stand, this aggression cannot stand, is that if we start changing borders by force in Europe, there's no, no end, end to it. it. Yeah. Bridget, if, if I could bring you in. Uh, I was very interested in your positive suggestions of how the European Union in particular could move. Uh, could I say, though, that looking at it from the other way, the treatment of Joseph Borrell in Moscow by Lavrov and Putin effectively displayed a degree of contempt for the European Union, which he does not display towards the nation states of Europe, France and Germany in particular. So isn't that the problem, that Europe is this great power in many ways, but at least for its biggest interlocutor, the Russians, it is not taken seriously at the uh, top level? So uh, Putin has a real problem with the EU because it's a model of economy and society uh, and a set of values that are, are at odds with what he wants. Uh, he certainly has a history of supporting the radical right in Europe. He has, was the banker for Marine Le Pen. He, his ideal Europe would be a Europe without the EU, but that's not a Europe that is available to Putin. And what has happened since Ukraine is that one has to think of the EU not just as the Brussels institutions, but the whole and the parts. And the EU, qua its the EU whole and its member states have been much have been much uh, speedier to act. The sanctions packages have come through the Commission. The use of the European peace facility within seventy two hours was sending lethal weapons to Ukraine. So I think you're dealing with, regardless of what Moscow thinks of the EU, uh, Moscow is dealing with an entity that it can't ignore and that has power. Now, for particularly for Germany, more than any other member state, the war in Ukraine has been a shattering of illusions. In my view, those illusions should never have existed. But the Germans are slowly and very painfully coming to terms with the shift, the Zeitenwende, why so difficult for them? Well, firstly, the decision on nuclear energy was has proved to be a disaster, created enormous vulnerability. There also is that uh, nostalgia for Ostpolitik, that Russia is a country one can do business with. But this Russia acting in this way is not a country that the EU or Germany can do business with in any traditional sense. Yes, there will be eventually negotiations, uh, but certainly uh, certainly not now. But the other problem for Germany is that there was a misalignment between its security context, where it is dependent on the United States, and its view of its political economy, a trading state. And this is not just with Russia, but also with China. So there is also a painful set of adjustments happening uh, particularly in my view in Germany. And that pacifist streak, the, the lesson the Germans learned from the Second World War, is being painfully unlearned because I fully agree that this is the last of the colonial wars. It is a battle between a post-colonial Europe and a Europe of empire, uh, but also uh, between a model of economy and society that deals diplomatically with major conflicts. And yes, the EU is riven by conflict, but no one sitting around the table today thinks that the EU is not a security community. In other words, that war is conceivable among the member states. So I do think that the EU, we of course, the EU is constrained in the area of defence, but that's because uh, defence is also Atlantic. 
and primarily Atlantic in terms of uh, collective defence. And in my view, the only thing that will shift that is not something that the Europeans want or desire, but the emergence in Washington of a president at some stage, it could be the next election, it could be another, where the commitment to the collective security of Europe is at an end. And therefore, then the onus would be on uh, Europe to come to its own defence. But that's there's so much uncertainty around that now that I think that we we simply don't know. These are unknowns. I'd like to bring in Sultan. Thanks, Bridget, on, on, on that point. Uh, I mean, the question of the Americans and their staying power. I mean, we saw what happened in Afghanistan, uh, although Biden had telegraphed that quite a long time in advance, if not exactly the mechanism whereby it happened. It could be Trump again. If it's not Trump again, it could be someone from the Trump wing of the party. It could be someone who says, you know, as, as Bob Dole suggested, we've got to get out of these Democrat wars, plowing under every fourth American boy. I mean, you know, he was somebody who fought the war, but he was in that mold of American rhetoric. So we could see boredom with Ukraine from the American side the Europeans having to do more by themselves or not. I mean, how do you think that could possibly play out, the degree of American commitment and their ability to keep, keep there, which they were not showing in Afghanistan? Well, I think the call for America first have uh, continued. I mean, it, it, we stopped hearing it from Trump and his uh, allies, but uh, people have started to, to appreciate and agree that we should have our our interests first. Particularly, if we, the cost of all of this is very high, particularly in the aftermath of COVID. I mean, this is all happening after two years of, of great economic pressure on everybody. And even at the level of individual families, to suddenly now, you're out, you're able to travel, but you can't afford to travel because the prices have gone up and so on. All of this is going to make uh, America, I think, to look more and more inwards and it will shorten the span of attention as far as Ukraine is concerned. In addition to that, the fact that they are determined to maintain Russia united and safe and secured with all the nuclear weapons it holds will ultimately uh, give Putin the, uh, the card he needs from the rest of the world to stabilize his situation and to offer him a ladder on which he climbs down from this conflict. I don't think it's gonna be a defeat I think there will be a way which Putin in particular and Russia in general will be allowed a way out uh, at, at, at the right moment. Uh, it, as I said earlier, it will cost a lot of lives in, in Ukraine as long as the West continues to supply weapons, but not to the capacity where they can defeat the Russians. I mean, we don't hear about anti-aircraft missiles being given to, to the Ukrainians. They are giving them vests to fight in, uh, guns. It's a bit like what happened in, in Syria to some extent. Uh, well, it's the opposite of maybe what happened in Syria. They did give proper weapons uh, uh, and, and, and so on. So I, I think uh, w the EU and the West is in a very difficult position. They want, they want the U to fight until the very last Ukrainian in order to teach the Russians a lesson. And I don't personally think this is going to happen. I think we may have a bit of disagreement about that <laughs> from the panel for Malcolm. And we'll get, but I mean, what, the question we're, we're all thinking is, what does actually Putin want? I mean, he's quite happy to have another Grozny, another Aleppo, and have places flat, presumably. We all agree on that. But what is his, I mean, is he Peter the Great? Or what, what's his historical perspective? Well, he compared think? himself last week to Peter yeah. the Great, you know, and he made a direct threat to the Baltic states and to Poland as well. So, I mean, I think we have to be realistic about his ambitions, that uh, they're not limited to the Donbass. He might settle for that now and a strip of territory in southern Ukraine, but the aim is the whole of Ukraine. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, we are actually supplying Ukraine with much heavier weapons than uh, than we gave the Syrians. I mean, there are anti-aircraft systems going in there. There's howitzers coming in, heavy howitzers coming in. They need more, of course, but they are coming from the West so that there's nothing half-hearted about that. And I also think this idea that uh, people who advocate uh, continuing uh, the fight against Russia, oh, you're willing to fight to the last Ukrainian. But if you actually speak to the vast majority of the Ukrainian population, they are willing to continue that fight as well. So it's not as if 
you know, we're prodding the Ukrainians uh, to fight our battles for us. Uh, you, one of the remarkable things about this has been not just the military effectiveness of the Ukrainian army, but the way Ukrainian civil society has responded to it, that they have really rallied to the cause. And what we're seeing now is the making of a Ukrainian nation forged in part mm. by Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's got the nightmare uh, that uh, there now exists a consolidated nation that is willing to fight. And I think that, you know, th this talk about us being willing to fight to the last Ukrainian nation is misplaced uh, as long as the Ukrainians want to fight. Just, I, I want to throw open, but, but Sultan, isn't the big difference with Syria that, that it's not two-sided in Syria? There's a government and there's a whole host of other people and other competence, and whereas Ukrainians mostly seem to be completely united about this. There is a two-sided conflict, and Syria is a multifaceted conflict. With the exception complex. of those in the, in the districts that are demanding separation. I mean, that's, mm. that's, that's the problem, I think, that mm. there, is no, there is no acknowledgement of this issue. It seems to be in the room, I don't know if. Uh, but based on our analysis, there is, and there was a, a recognition of these people in the agreements that they signed back in 2015. So the fact that they signed, the Ukrainians and the Russians, an agreement that talked about separatist movements means they exist. Ma Malcolm, a bit more than that. I, mean, I don't know where, why we can't... There, there has never been a free vote in Donetsk and Luhansk on whether or not they want a different status from the rest of Ukraine. But if the million plus people who fled the Donbass <laughs> after 2014 into the rest of Ukraine uh, were allowed to re return and take part in that vote, as well as the people who've remained, because people who remain perhaps are more sympathetic to the Russians, but if the whole population were prepared to vote, who knows? Maybe we should have the United Nations uh, supervise uh, that. I mean, one of the problems with the Minsk Agreement, uh, which you write was forced on the Ukrainians, was the sequencing was one in which it gave enormous power to these unelected Russian-imposed leaders uh, rather than having a UN or OSCE force coming into that area, allowing people to return to their homes and then ask them what their, sure. what their future is. So I think we need to get away from this idea that somehow or other uh, the people in, in those areas were uniquely uh, against the Ukrainian state. There were certainly tensions, absolutely there were tensions, and you saw that in successive elections. But up until 2014, uh, Ukraine was actually, like most democratic states, a country which was regionally divided, but people accepted they should resolve those differences within the Ukrainian framework. It was the Russians that destroyed that framework in 2014. Let's see if anyone would like to ask a question. There's a gentleman there. Any, anybody else? A lady would like to ask a question? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll get one microphone to you, and yep, gentleman there first. Thank you very much, uh, fascinating panel. My name's uh, Simon Sweeney, I'm a lecturer here in the University of York. I've got one question for Bridget, if I may, and one for Sultan. To Bridget first, Bridget, we have the European Security and Defence Policy, which since it was initiated in the early 2000s, focuses mainly on civilian security and uh, crisis management. It's always lacked the D, it's always lacked the defense. And my question is that far from having a European army, we seem to be having a European Union marching into irrelevance in terms of its capacity to defend its own continental space. If the defense element in CSDP is to be enhanced, and Europe is to achieve something resembling strategic autonomy, you mentioned the possibility of American withdrawal from providing the security uh, umbrella to the European continent, because we can't really predict that, but it's a possibility. How do you see the position of the United Kingdom, which is NATO Europe's largest contributor? Because of Brexit, this government has taken the UK away from the European Union, do you think the UK can be reinstated as a player and a significant contributor to European Union security and defence okay. policy? Okay, Bridget. Uh, 
so firstly, uh, the UK will not be a contributor to something called the European Security and Defence Policy because that's EU. And until uh, the United Kingdom has another government, it won't it simply wouldn't agree to be part of anything that has the EU label. Secondly, constitutionally, the EU is much weaker on defence than it is obviously uh, on uh, regulation and the economy and also soft security. The only circumstances in which I see the emergence of a stronger D in the EU, uh, as in something approaching collective defence, is if the American guarantees to Europe disappear. But that doesn't mean that things are not happening. So what what's what the strategic compass was agreed, it was the first time the EU, and this was aided, I think, by the absence of Britain in one sense, uh, had agreement on uh, common security threats and they do want a crisis management. Uh, they do want a crisis management uh, capacity in terms of D uh, by uh, 2030. <laughs> I would see the EU continuing to do, for me, the priority should be not strategic autonomy just now, but strategic capability, because all European countries are about to spend more on, on defence. And it really is important that that money isn't wasted, that there are coalitions of the willing to work on interoperability. The EU, the EU member states and the lack of interoperability, including the United Kingdom in defence in Europe, is a scandal in my view and has been for a very long time. So I think one shouldn't one shouldn't expect the EU to go from where it is now to uh, somewhere very different with a much stronger defence arm. That might come, but in my view, that will only come in certain circumstances, and the Europeans would prefer those circumstances don't exist. Uh, so I would say now on the role of the United Kingdom, ideally, in terms of the uh, UK and its relationship with the EU, it would be much better if in addition to the bilateral relations, which the UK works and is working very hard at the moment, uh, that there would be also some multilateral element, either a European Security Council, which uh, Macron has mentioned from time to time, or some way of ensuring that as Europe, not EU, but as Europe faces uh, the defence um, challenges of the next 30 to 40 years, that this does not involve competition between most of Europe and the United Kingdom. And I do see that happening. There's strong functional reasons why it should, but it won't happen with a UK government that is ideologically and fundamentally opposed to the EU. There is a lot of EU phobia alive and well in the Conservative Party, and that damages the United Kingdom, but also damages the rest of Europe. So I would look forward to better relations, but I don't see the circumstances in which those improvements happen. While the United Kingdom, just think about it, as Ukraine, uh, as that conflict evolves, uh, the United Kingdom is in the process of uh, passing a law that breaks an international agreement with its neighbours in Europe. So I think the UK can't have it every other way. Uh, so there will be, I think, uh, a time. The time will come. I can't put a date on that because I don't know uh, what the future of UK politics brings. Uh, I don't know what kind of government will be in power in London after the next election. Is it desirable that relations improve? Absolutely. For both sides. For both sides. Thank you, Bridget. And I, I know you've got another question, sir, but there's a lady at the back first, and I'll come to you if, the, if there aren't any. Just trying to get around as many as we can. Thank you very much. My name is Olesa Kromachuk, in case you were not here at the previous panel when I spoke. I'm a historian of Ukraine. I can't believe we're talking about Minsk agreements again as some kind of legitimate document. I mean, they were signed at gunpoint and they were signed spe specifically to keep Ukraine destabilized for as long as possible and for Russia to keep pretending that it is not a party in this war, but as some kind of, um, you know, negotiator or an outsider in this war, right? And, and when that became um, impossible to sustain for Russia, Russia, 
proclaimed Min, uh, Luhansk and uh, Donetsk republics as, you know, recognized them as republics and therefore essentially killed the Minsk agreements. So it's, it's a pity that we go back to discussing them as some kind of legitimate document. I have two questions about the question of security. So the first, we, when we think about security, we often think about defense and that's understandable, and the army and so on. Um, but we also, we forget about personal security. We forget about very quickly about sort of feeling safe, having freedom to express yourself, freedom of assembly, freedom of practicing uh, religious and other beliefs and so on, um, making decisions independently, right? So what sort of peace uh, can Ukraine negotiate um, with Putin, who is not interested in negotiations, who is interested in war, because that keeps him in power, um, to provide security to people in occupied territories, people who are under constant threat of torture, kidnapping, uh, being thrown in jail, and so on. And the second question that relates to security is about uh, nuclear threat. So we're all afraid about nu of nuclear war with Russia here in, in the West. And believe me, Ukrainians are also afraid of nuclear war because they would be the primary target. But what we forget in that respect is that Chernobyl zone was occupied for five weeks by the Russian troops. And we, I think we're lucky that we escaped some kind of major uh, accident there. And the largest power station, uh, nuclear power station in Europe is outside of Zaporizhia, which is in extremely close proximity to um, extremely violent activity. And it's actually been hit by uh, Russian shells uh, already. And we've just been really lucky that the training center was hit and not a reactor. What provisions do we have for that kind of nuclear threat in, in terms of European security? Thank you. Maybe, Malcolm, you could take something on the, on the nuclear threat and you know, the question of whether there could be some kind of limited nuclear explosion, either that kind of or um, a, a battlefield nuclear weapon in, uh, in this conflict. Th those are two separate, but really both very important questions. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think uh, the largest part of Ukraine's electricity supply was nuclear generated. Uh, when people in, in the recent decades have talked about nuclear security, <laughs> we've talked about terrorist attacks, uh, we've talked about other things, but, but the idea that we'd have nuclear power stations in a war zone <laughs> uh, and with one of the parties seeming you know, to have such a cavalier attitude towards mm -hmm. that is quite incredible. And of course, uh, the, the, uh, one of the plants you've mentioned there, uh, it's, uh, it's under Russian occupation. The workers there uh, are being arrested uh, on suspicion of working with the Ukrainian security services. Uh, and you could well see the Ukrainians trying to retake it. So this is a, a, a really difficult issue. So, uh, and we, we, we have to keep an eye on it. In terms of what the international community is doing about it, the International Atomic Energy Agency is seeking to get access to these facilities uh, to make sure the nuclear material isn't being diverted because there's nuclear material that could be used uh, for, for military purposes uh, by the Russians or, or others. So it's very important that access is re-established. But I, I worry about that. I mean, in a way, it's, it's a very important risk. On the, in the question of uh, battlefield nuclear, actually, I think, for me, the, the biggest risk is we get to a situation, and I wouldn't want to overstate the risk, I think it's still a relatively small risk, but the consequences are, mm -hmm. are potentially massive is that there are circumstances in which uh, the Russian government may think it's in its interest to threaten the use of mm -hmm. nuclear weapons and challenge the United States and others uh, to consider whether they're to be prepared to take the risk that he's bluffing. Mm -hmm. Now, it would be enormously risky for Russia to do that, and I think the circumstances in which they'd be prepared to do that are relatively limited, but I do think they exist, and I think both uh, uh, this February and in 2014, uh, the Russians sent out, President Putin sent out, I think a rather clear signal that uh, the Russian nuclear use would be on the table uh, if you got to a direct conflict between NATO forces mm -hmm. and Russian forces. And indeed, President Biden has made it very clear that's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why American troops won't didn't get involved in the no-fly zone and today are not getting involved in trying to break the Black Sea blockade by force because of that risk. I think uh, right now uh, we don't have a direct 
clash of arms between NATO and Russia. If you got to that, and of course, if, you, I, if I was a Ukrainian, I'd be thinking, why aren't the Brits and the Americans sending their troops? Why are they only sending us missiles and tanks and, uh, and, and so on? And th that fear of escalation is absolutely part of the reason why there's that degree of restraint. But couldn't, couldn't you, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but yeah. couldn't you put that the other way around, which is if a tactical uh, battlefield nuclear weapon was used, yeah. that would lead to the conflict. So uh, with, with, with no NATO, well, I wouldn't think, it? I think so if, the, 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 you're assuming that, the, that Putin's it, a rational actor in this and he will, won't do it, but he might threaten it. Is that, is it's, that what, it's the threat. The threat. That's the tool rather than the use. So I think it's most, most improbable right. that Russia will use nuclear weapons without first threatening to do so. Right. Because actually using them, uh, from a, if Russia were right. to use them, then I think uh, the, the chances of a, an American conventional involvement, it would be very high. And if, it, I mean, I've heard Western <laughs> military leaders say to me, look, that Black Sea fleet wouldn't last 24 hours right. if NATO got involved. And that's true of a lot of Russian military capability. They've shown their weakness even against Ukraine if they came up against the power of the United States and the United Kingdom, but most of all the Americans, uh, then they would, be, they would be defeated. I think in relatively short order uh, on their own territory as well. And those are the circumstances in which you begin to think this is existential. This is not existential for, for Russia now. right now. They can walk away anytime they like. Thank you. Some other thoughts, questions? Uh, there's a lady down in front, a gentleman there. Hi, I'm Louisa Wojciechowska. I just wondered if any, uh, Transnistria, is that playing any part in the Russian war on Ukraine? Because obviously it's autonomous, but it's been, what I've read is kind of Russian control and they run guns through it. Is that an important part playing in this for? Mm -hmm. Shane? Yes, it, it does figure. And what's interesting about the conflict in Transnistria is that started long before there was any talk about NATO expansion, EU uh, enlargement. Uh, it's something that, uh, again, was fermented uh, from the outside, from the Russian side. Uh, not so long ago, uh, there was a sudden fear that uh, there might be an attack coming out of Transnistria towards, uh, mm -hmm. towards Odessa. Um, it largely seemed to have been not serious, but to divert Ukrainian troops away from other, uh, other areas of the front. I mean, again, it's another one of these, uns, uh, I suppose, frozen conflicts that can be heated up at, at any time when it suits the Kremlin's interest. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it is playing an ongoing role uh, to be activated as and when necessary in the, in the Kremlin's interests. Carry on just with the EU thing, with Moldova wanting to join the EU, and obviously they've got this issue here, that must affect their membership or their... Yes? Yes, yeah, I, I'm yeah, sure yeah. it makes it anywhere with the conflict, makes it much more difficult to, to join into I mean, I think that's one of the questions in relation to Ukraine as well. The EU is about to offer memberships uh, action, uh, a membership process to Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, but both of them have unresolved territorial issues. Uh, so, the, I mean, Bridget Proy is the expert on this, but those will presumably have to be resolved. Uh, otherwise, you're ending up having a member state like Cyprus, uh, which is in a territorial dispute. Um, gentleman there, and then I can come back to you, sir, if we've got time. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, uh, Alan Taylor. Um, clearly, the Ukrainians are, are willing to fight and to continue fighting. Uh, Assuming that the West is prepared to continue supporting Ukraine with <coughs> weapons and ammunition, is it possible that the Russians could still win a military victory in any shape or form? I mean, they, we, 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 you know, they've taken enormous losses. Uh, we read that they are probably running short of uh, missiles, at least, uh, you know, intelligent missiles. Um, and I imagine that the morale amongst the Russian forces is, is pretty low. So. You know, is there any realistic prospect, assuming that the West stands firm, and that's obviously a big if, but assuming that, is there any realistic chance that Russia may still be able to get a military victory? 
Uh, Malcolm, and, and it could be, I mean, uh, Sultan also touched on this. Uh, maybe I'll go with you first, because you suggested, it uh, reminded me of Tacitus, we made a desert and we called it peace, you know, uh, it, 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 which is Grozny and Aleppo, isn't it? They could win a victory under those circumstances, perhaps. Well, I think I, like everybody else, was surprised of the way Putin pushed the troops in. Because if the objective was to occupy Ukraine or to annex the region, that's not how you would fight that war. You know, you start by cutting off supplies, hitting the airports, taking out all the potential of any assistance coming from the EU to the Ukrainians. But the fact that he kept talking about it as a special operation, then he led his ground troops in. Uh, maybe he was misled that he, 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 he thought there would be no resistance. Does actually, uh, to me, uh, point to the fact that it was part of his negotiation strategy that he started to work in December 2021 when he was communicating with the Americans and everybody else about the expansion of NATO and drawing lines in the sand. You do not do this, you do not do this, you do not do this. They were not responding. He felt maybe I will push these troops in as part of a bluffing, whatever it is. And in fact, that is supported by the fact that many of his generals were surprised of, of when, when they were, uh, his, his own people were surprised of the decision to go in. Then he got trapped. And this is why we're saying he now needs to be offered a way out. Uh, and with him being trapped with the power he has, I don't think we've seen anything yet of what Russia can do in Ukraine. I mean, this is uh, not, uh, it's nothing really. Of, they haven't used the traditional weapons to the extreme that they have, that, that they can use it. And uh, I think we have to remember how destructive traditional weapons can be, forget about nuclear weapons, they can be much more devastating than what you've seen uh, at the moment. Think of the uh, mother bomb that the Americans uh, blew up in uh, Afghanistan. That is a traditional weapon and it acts as if it's a nuclear weapon. So we have to put it in perspective and be really realistic about what Russia can still, uh, can still do in, in Ukraine. We both also want to come. I mean, sorry, if I may, I mean, yeah. the, alter, the other way to stop it is to allow Ukraine to be a threat to Russia, and that's not happening. Other Ukrainians are able to use ballistic missiles to threaten mm. Russian cities mm. so that the Russians feel the pain of this war? No. Okay. Are we going to support them to that level? No. So this is why I'm saying it's going to uh, drag on for some time. A Russian possible, possible I mean, victory? Russia could win this uh, militarily, but I think it, they're unlikely to. Uh, I, I think they, they have devoted, this is a special military operation for Putin, uh, and that means there hasn't been a nationwide mobilization uh, of resources. They haven't transformed uh, themselves into a war economy as they did in 1941. Uh, they're still, uh, and uh, that, that speaks, I think, to a degree of political weakness domestically in Put uh, for Putin, that he doesn't, uh, he feels that's risky if he was to go down that route. So in that sense, they do have reserves to call upon, particularly of people. But they have a real problem with the production of new weapons uh, because so many of their most sophisticated weapons are dependent on Im imported American components. Uh, and some, some of our researchers at RUSI have been taking apart captured <laughs> Russian weapons and sourcing where all those chips and so on are coming from. And the, the Russians are going to find it a lot harder to get those components in future. And even if they do one way or another, it's going to take a long time to rebuild. They are running down their stocks of their most modern weapons. Most of the tanks now appearing in the Donbass, the new uh, generations of tanks, are T-62s. <laughs> uh, these are weapons which were old even at the end of the Cold War, uh, and they don't have the degree of protection and so on that's necessary to fight. But they have some value. Uh, but uh, there's, there's, there's a limit to the extent that you can substitute quality by mass. The Russians are trying to do that on a very large scale in the Donbass. They're focusing all their effort there. But the Ukrainians are making gains in Kherson, in part as a result of that Russian concentration. The Ukrainians, however, do also have a problem. Because in terms of the amount of money uh, we are spending providing weapons uh, to Ukraine, there is no contest in terms of the... The, the equivalent Russian figure. The problem is the absorption capacity of the Ukrainian military. Uh, 
They don't, you could, you could send something over the Polish Ukrainian border, it's a long way to the front, several hundred miles, but you have to repair those weapons, you have to maintain those weapons, you have to have the people to do that for weapons with which the Ukrainian military is not familiar. In the, last, the first few months, uh, the deliberate decision was taken to provide the Ukrainians with ex-Soviet weapons from Eastern European countries with which the Ukrainian military were familiar. We're running out of those. <laughs> they now have to, increasingly over the next months, switch over to Western weapons, which are much more sophisticated, have a lot more logistical challenges. And if every time something breaks down, an engine part breaks down in, in Donbass, you can't take it all the way back to Poland to repair it. So, uh, and of course, the Ukrainian economy is shot. The uh, Ukrainian economy is much worse affected than the Russian economy. So that also, I think, is a point of vulnerability. So at this moment of time, I think it's, it's anybody's guess uh, who will be ahead militarily. But I certainly wouldn't rule out uh, a Russian route, uh, but I don't think it's inevitable. Shane? Yeah, I, I think we need to be careful about not overestimating the strength uh, of the Russian army, of... of Basically, we're still sort of uh, dazzled by images of the Red Army in 1945, taking the Reichstag, taking Berlin. This isn't the Russian army today. What we've seen uh, is an army that's both brutal and, and incompetent. And I think that uh, the Ukrainians have more than held their own uh, when they've had the right weapons. Uh, for me, it, it seems to me that uh, the Russians haven't pulled punches in Ukraine. If you look at Mariupol, if you look at uh, other cities there, they have raised those cities. It's not as if uh, they've been fighting with one hand behind their back. They are experiencing extreme problems at the moment, and I think that, uh, again, we need to move away from this position that there's somehow it's the army of 1945 relative to the rest of the world. It's not, actually. They are much weaker, and the Russian military has been shown to be a Pachomkin village, much like um, everything else that is in Putin's, uh, in, in Putin's Russia. So I do think we need to be, a, uh, not to underestimate Russia's power, but also not to overestimate it uh, either. And I I think the Ukrainians have shown themselves remarkably adept at adapting to Western technology, Western weapons as well. I've seen interviews with Ukrainian military uh, artillery men, uh, and they can pick it up extremely quickly. What what they need to learn. I mean, they seem very adept at that. And I think the Ukrainians are fighting a 21st century war, and the Russians are still fighting the uh, one from the mid 20th century. We have literally only got a couple of minutes left. Can I just ask one one question of Mark because uh, it's it's something. Uh, which has occurred in other forums that I've been at, which is we heard in the, bio, in the um, uh, Obama years about the pivot to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And we heard from <laughs> Trump about China being terrible. Where is that now? I mean, how much focus can there be even for a superpower on two major theatres, one of which is uh, the Pacific and the other is Europe? There absolutely is a trade-off. I mean, I remember uh, in the months up to 9-11, there was a pivot <laughs> yeah. to the Pacific. There's been a lot of pivots. And that got lost for 20 years. <laughs> and we're seeing that debate playing out again. You know, I think, and here I agree with Sultan, that the, I think this is the high point of American engagement in European security. Right. I think as this crisis, if this war goes on for quite a long time, the pressures in the United States from both sides of the house to re-energize their commitment to Asia will increase. And therefore, Europeans and Ukrainians <laughs> have got a limited time opportunity to get this right. And I think it's especially important, therefore, from a broader NATO perspective, that we get very clear commitments uh, for long-term American troop commitments to Europe, particularly Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, which will, to the extent possible, bind uh, future American congresses and presidents. Because I don't think the Congress that takes uh, comes into the, the Republican majority after November and the likely Republican president in two years' time it will be anything like as sympathetic to European concerns as the current administration is. That's a subject for another York Festival of Ideas, I think. I think. But thank you to our great guests, and thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you.